It has been over 20 years since the Rwandan genocide that killed close to a million people. While the world moves on, for those who were personally touched by the most horrendous event in recent history, it is just like yesterday. Console Nishimwe was 14 in 1994. Her father and three male siblings were murdered. In a recent conversation, Ms. Nishimwe shared, shared our story of survival, healing, and hope. We were five of us. I was the oldest. I was 14 years old in 1994, and my sister, and the youngest was almost 18 months old. Did you get a sense of uh, any tension uh, around the country, any uh, of the ongoings politically, the rebel activities, the government crackdown on opposition or anything? Did you get a sense of that? I was, um, you know, targeted. I was a Tutsi, so because of at school, I was bullied at school, you know, with my classmate, actually, who was calling me a Tutsi and cockroach. So at that time, um, that's when I, I realized how, how big it was. And then around me, I was seeing what was happening and in the country hearing that, you know, on the radio myself, when my parents were listening to the radio, I was listening as well. So you would say the conversations about uh, this uh, imminent genocide, you started hearing it way before. Yes, yes, I started hearing it way before. But of course, as I was, even though I was hearing very much, I was young, I still I was having a normal, you know, going back to my normal life like any other young kid. But, but at the same time, I could feel it. I could hear it um, around me. And I, later around, when my parents, actually my mom told me what, how she was mistreated, that's when I understood much better. When this started, the actual genocide started, do you remember where you were? Yes, I remember. I was with my both parents um, and my siblings. We were actually um, in this small community. Actually, at that time when it started in Kigali, in our town, the people thought they could protect us. So we went to a small community, a Muslim community. That's where we, we stayed. So waiting and thinking that things would get better. But that was not the case. Were there many other Tutsis in that town? Yes, there were so many because where we were actually was not far from the uh, communal office. So there were so many Tutsis coming from the areas where they were, their homes were being burned down. So they were coming, gathering around, thinking that they would seek refuge around there. But that was not a very easy thing for them because they wanted to have them around so they can kill them afterwards. Yeah. What really started happening when you got to a point where you knew now our lives are just about to change so drastically. When I knew that our lives were going to change drastically, that's when actually we went to hiding. In that area, they told us, well, on the radio everywhere, they said Tutsis will be killed, so you have to go into hiding. So that's when finding ourselves in, in the bushes and um, when the kiddos were around with the machetes and screaming, exterminate them and hiding there, that's when I realized this is going to be something very bad for us. Now, you used to be with other people, uh, neighbors or people you knew where you lived uh, who are not Tutsi like you. Did uh, something change about them? It was very hard for me to watch how people have changed, it suddenly changed. Because these are the people that we shared everything and, you know, coming to our homes and shared meals. But suddenly, most of them changed, really changed. When I remember many times when you went to hiding to them, so to ask refuge for them. So these are the people who called killers for us. And a lot of times, um, it, it was very hard for me to, to see someone that who used to come home all of a sudden changing and when you you go there to ask for help, and then instead of helping you, they are calling killers for you. So, and they have done so many bad things for us when we, we, we even were hiding. And so these are the people who were coming to us when we were hiding there with machetes. And, you know, it, it was very hard. It was very hard to watch, yeah. Well, tomorrow we will bring you part two of my interview with Consulé Nishimwe, a Rwandan genocide survivor.